the Demon Core, a sphere of plutonium that has become infamous for the two criticality accidents that surround it. But what is the story of this object, from beginning to end? Let's explore the first accident, that claimed the life of Harry Dalian. Meet Rufus, a 6.2 kilogram sphere of plutonium. Yes, that was the Demon Core's original name, and yes, I will be using it for the duration of this video. Well, currently it's not actually a sphere, it's two hemispheres, kept separate to increase the surface area and prevent it going critical. Good idea. Rufus was also not the first of its kind. 26.136 kilograms of plutonium had been produced by August 30th, 1945 at Hanford, with the first 12.292 kilograms going on to form hemispheres 1, 2, 3, and 4. Hemispheres 1 and 2 were placed inside this much larger sphere called Gadget. Gadget was in fact the nickname for a bomb, given by the Los Alamos scientists. The code name for this device was Trinity. On July 16th, 1945, a 25-kiloton TNT equivalent explosion illuminated the skies. Hell had been unleashed, and two of the plutonium spheres had been expended. Less than a month later, on August 6th, a uranium gun type bomb nicknamed Little Boy was detonated over Hiroshima, producing 15 kilotons. And then, on August 9th, a 5 kilogram sphere of plutonium within the bomb Fat Man was imploded 2 miles off target into a valley in Nagasaki, with a yield of 21 kilotons of TNT. Hemispheres 5 and 6, or Rufus, was scheduled to be the third shot, and was expected to be ready for detonation over another Japanese city, possibly Tokyo, by August 24th. However, President Truman had already suspended nuclear bombings on Japan on August 10th. In other words, it wouldn't be needed. Still, they went ahead and cast the plutonium into the two hemispheres, and the anti-jet ring that sat between them. And then it remained at Los Alamos, not to be used as the core of a bomb, but as a science experiment. Harry Dalian was a hard worker at Omega Site, a site purpose-built for the water boiler reactor, a very small reactor used to experiment with homogeneous uranium in preparation for the atomic bomb. However, the research expanded into general criticality research, and that's where Dalian, the son of an X-ray technician, found his place. What fascinated Dalian the most was the science behind criticality, understanding the mechanism behind it all, which was not well explored at the time. Of course, they knew that neutrons were key to nuclear fission, but the science and process involved in achieving the critical masses necessary was not well understood. They wanted measurements. They needed research. His work with Rufus was not the first of these experiments, which became known as Tickling the Dragon's Tail. The name seems very appropriate in context. Should they wake the dragon, they would all be burned by the fiery criticality. It also was not the bearer of the name. For that, we need to look at the Dragon Machine, also known as the Uranium Guillotine. This device created the world's first prompt criticality through a very unorthodox method. A cylinder of highly enriched uranium was dropped through a ring of equally highly enriched uranium, creating a prompt criticality and heating the fuel by 2 degrees Celsius every millisecond. However, should the cylinder have become stuck for any reason, it would have caused a huge neutron radiation release and potentially caused an explosion that might have killed everyone in the building. As you can see, the health and safety standards were low, to say the least. On August 21st, Dalian conducted another one of these dragon experiments, using Rufus literally at the centre of it all. The experiment itself was simple. 
Knowing that tungsten carbide was a good neutron reflector, they could stack the material in blocks around the sphere to see how the neutron count was influenced, approaching criticality. Obviously, they wanted to stop short of that for their health and safety. The overall goal was to find a perfect cube that could create a fission reaction. That morning, Dalian and a team assembled a square base of tungsten carbide, with each side measuring 14 and 7 eighths of an inch, or 37.8 centimetres, and began to place tungsten carbide blocks around Rufus. According to Otto Frisch, the man who coined the term tickling the dragon's tail, these blocks were in fact very slippery, and could easily fall from one's hand. Anyway, the experiment did eventually reach that narrow point of criticality, the clicking of instruments monitoring the neutron count, spiking once the fifth layer had been completed, and two more blocks were placed on the sixth layer. One by one, the tungsten carbide blocks were removed from the pile, and Dalian got ready to assemble a smaller cube around Rufus. This one was 12 and 3 quarter inches, or 32.4 centimetres, and they got to assembling the cube again. With the smaller cube, neutrons were being reflected more densely, and the sphere became critical on the completion of the fifth layer. Yet again, Dalian disassembled the structure. The next phase of the experiment required an even smaller base, but there wasn't any time left in the day to complete it. There was a science lecture to attend that evening. Dalian of course attended it, and while listening, he had the idea for a new setup, this time with a side length all the way down to 10 and 5 eighths of an inch, just 27 centimetres. But now he was going to conduct the experiment on his own that evening. And so Dalian made his way back to Omega Site, passing by a worker, a friend also from Omega Site, who wanted to suggest that they take a break and watch a movie. But in the moment, he did not ask Dalian. This simple decision would cost Dalian his life. Sneaking back to the laboratory alone, there was only one other person, a guard by the name of Robert J. Hemley, who acted as the only barrier between Dalian and his experiments. Hemley's job was to act as a fire spotter, and especially, to deter thieves. Dalian was nervous, he went straight to the workbench as Hemley watched, and Hemley just said, Hi Harry, and went back to reading his newspaper at the desk, facing away from Dalian and Rufus. And so Dalian was left to his own devices in assembling the block of tungsten carbide around the plutonium sphere. At this point we should also mention that Dalian was not following lab safety procedures, either. Officially the tungsten carbide assembly had to be assembled from scratch but Dalian was using a pre-assembled base layer of bricks and putting Rufus inside of it, and then assembling the rest of the layers. Officially, bricks had to be slowly slid across towards the sphere to carefully monitor the neutron count. Instead, Dalian would hold the bricks over the sphere, listening for the clicks of the neutron count, and then either place or remove the brick. We don't know how high this cube got, as Dalian placed the blocks around Rufus. Hemley was too busy reading the newspaper and familiar with the clicking sound of the neutron counter. But then, everything went wrong, and the neutron counters screamed with activity. Two critical factors in the story had come together. The slippery tungsten carbide, and Dalian holding the bricks over the plutonium sphere, instead of sliding them. Presumably, while holding one of these blocks over the cube, it fell from his hands and landed on top of the plutonium sphere, reflecting enough neutrons to push Rufus into a supercritical state. More neutrons were being produced by fission than lost. 
The air surrounding the tungsten began to glow blue-purple as it was ionized by the radiation released from the core. A mad rush began to disassemble the core. Initially, Darlian lifted up the dropped block off the mass, but his hand reflexed from the heat and he dropped it back on. Next plan, try to pull the other bricks off, but the structure was too heavy to remove. Instead, he tried to throw the table over to destroy the mass, but it was far too heavy to budge. Hemley turned around to look at Dalian, who was now stood limp and perplexed at what to do. Finally, with no other choice, Dalian hastily yet methodically disassembled the structure until the criticality subsided, and left Rufus like that. Dalian was quite sure he wasn't going to die though. Sure, the criticality had lasted a long time, but others in the Manhattan Project had survived them, and he had the tungsten carbide reflectors as shielding. He should have been fine, he thought, as a student who had driven to the Omega site found him, and brought him to a hospital. The worst part of understanding radiation sickness is knowing what is going to happen to you. Over the first day, Darlian fell ill. He couldn't eat and was constantly vomiting and then retching when there was nothing else left in his stomach. His right arm swelled up with a firm fluid half an hour after the exposure, both hands turning numb, and a small blister appeared on his ring finger. The next day, Darlian felt weak and the numbness of his hands became pain. More blisters appeared on his right hand, his nail beds turning blue and his skin cold. He was losing circulation in those areas. His left arm was turning red and swelling up. Both arms were the most highly exposed areas, from when he disassembled the tungsten carbide blocks, and they were becoming the first areas to feel the full effects of radiation exposure. Day 3 Dalian had a fever, and the pain in his right arm was growing more intense, as were the blisters. Assuming they were the cause of his poor circulation, doctors decided to remove them. Dalian was placed under general anaesthesia, and the blisters were opened. An intensely yellow fluid oozed out, and they were cleared out. Meanwhile, the reddening of his skin spread up his arm onto his torso, appearing like a bright sunburn. <coughs> Over the next few days, Dalian's condition continued to worsen. His temperature continued to climb, and his pulse climbed above 100 beats per minute, not falling. His right arm turned purple and swelled all the way up to his shoulder. Not even painful, just feeling nothing. His fingernails fell off as the tips of his fingers turned black with necrosis. The skin of his left hand turned tight and dry, and ulcers formed inside his mouth. On day 12 after exposure, his mouth was coated with a greyish-white membrane. His GI tract was now suffering from radiation exposure. On day 13 after exposure, Dalian's left arm began to follow the course of the right one. Blisters emerged on his palm and thumb and even his wrist. With no choice, doctors again had to remove the dying skin. The next day, his eyes turned red with a terrible burning sensation. And on day 15, his left thumb had turned gangrenous. On day 17, Dalian became unable to ingest fluids, simply vomiting them back up. From now on, everything was administered intravenously. The blisters continued to be a problem, now emerging on his torso, and now hair was falling out on his right temple. The next day, there was some small improvement, as the lesions in his mouth subsided and his appetite returned. But day 19 saw the beginning of the end for Dalian, as the skin on his face and neck began to peel off, the skin appearing stretched over his body, and now his beard hair was falling out. 
The next day, more of his skin peeled off until his entire torso appeared like a third degree burn. And finally, 24 days after exposure, Dalian's fever reached beyond 41 degrees Celsius, or 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Dalian became irrational, angry, and slipped into a coma, which he would never wake up from. At 4.30pm on September 15th, 1945, Harry Dalian succumbed to his injuries. He was 24 years old. His body had shrunk from malnutrition, reddened by radiation burns. As for Robert Hemmerley, his radiation exposure was minimal, estimated at less than 5% of what Dalian received. After three days in hospital, he was discharged and barred from working at the Omega site for two months. He passed away from leukemia, aged 61. Information about the accident was covered up, of course. A press release claimed Dalian died from burns from an industrial accident, released five days after his death. The announcement took up just one paragraph of the press release, with the other three dedicated to a university opening up at Los Alamos. On May 20th, 2000, Armed Forces Day, a memorial was held in New London, Connecticut, with the surviving family and friends of Dalian, plus city officials and others who joined to commemorate Dalian's memory. A flag was raised in his honour, and a memorial stone unveiled. Finally, his widowed wife was given a proclamation by the mayor in his honour. Whereas Dalian died in September of 1945 after an accidental exposure to atomic radiation during an experiment at the secret Los Alamos National Laboratory, and whereas Harry Dalian was a native son of New London who graduated first in his class at Harbour School and first in his class in mathematics at Berkeley. He then went on to complete his undergraduate degree at MIT before his 21st birthday, and whereas Harry Dalian later became part of the top secret atomic bomb development known as the Manhattan Project, assisting other scientists in ending World War II, and whereas Harry Dalian is warmly remembered by his friends, such as former police chief John Crowley, as simply the kid who lived just a couple of doors away, who played with us at Calkins Park. And, whereas, his family, friends, and the city of New London wished to remember and reflect upon those aspects of Harry Dalian's life that illustrated his love of family and community. And, whereas, we gather here today to dedicate this flagpole in a place that was important to Harry Dalian as a young child and a cause to pause and wonder what other contributions might have been possible had his young life not ended so tragically. Now therefore I, Ronald W. Nozick, Mayor of the City of New London, sign this proclamation of remembrance and dedication in memory of Harry Dalian. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city to be affixed this 20th day of May, 2000. And as for Rufus, it would remain at Los Alamos, to be used for further experiments. <laughs>